Hello and welcome to Marinations. My name is Sharon Skolnick Bagnoli and I'm here today at the Marin Museum of the American Indian with Colleen Hicks who is runs the museum. What is your title? I'm Colleen? the executive director. Okay. And we are now the Museum of the American Indian. We did take off the title Marin ah. because we have people coming from all over the Bay Area. So we really are more than just a, a county museum. We're really a Bay Area museum. That's an important point, I think, that a lot of people probably don't realize it and don't know about this amazing gem that's here. Can you talk a little about what it looks like and where it is located? Yes, we're in Miwok Park in Nevada. And we've been here, this is our 47th year. And it's a very exciting place. And I do have people that, because it's, um, it's a house that was bought by the Kiwanis 47 years ago, and it is boarded up. So people don't realize that it's how wonderful it is inside. All the incredible artifacts and replicated artifacts and the collections and the exhibits. So we really encourage people to go past the, what they think it is from the outside. But at that isn't so bad in a way because it blends into the park really beautifully, which, you know, our relationship with the park is really important in our teaching mm -hmm. because we have a lot, thousands of school children come every year because in the California State Social Studies curriculum, the children are supposed to learn about their local natives. And so they come here and we use the park as part of our classroom. A long time ago. Squash Girl had been out and about roaming around, having a good time, but feeling hungry. Oh, oh so, so very, very hungry. hungry. When she heard her sisters laughing and giggling, so she came on back and she said, I wonder what's going on here. And just as she raised her hand to say something, Corn Girl said, oh, What just happened? What just happened? My feet, they just cooled off. They're, they're not hot anymore. What just happened? Well, Squash Girl was down there and she noticed that when she raised her arm, it created shade over her feet. Oh, now Squash Girl got an idea. And she said, listen, I have an idea. If I spread my broad green leaves around, I'll keep your feet cool and moist. Oh, and Bean Girl, that's going to benefit you, too, because, you know, all those critters and bugs and stuff, they won't bother you. And those warrior weeds, well, they're going to have an awful hard time getting past my big wrinkly arms. In exchange, do you think maybe I could get a meal? And Bean Girl said, well, yes, 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 of course. I'd be so happy to do that. And so Squash Girl spread her leaves all around, protecting Bean Girl and and from that day forward, Bean, Corn, and Squash decided they should always work together, cooperatively help each other out. And because they did, they lived happily and healthier for the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. Oh, story done. Oh. each time. <laughs> so this is an example of what corn, bean, and squash would look together. Mm. And I once did a garden based on that. I don't, always was interested in gardens. And one time I did a 50 by 50 square foot garden. Mm. I had rows and rows of corn, and I planted the beans. I had squash, and the beans were going up the, the stalk. It was really awesome. So Native Americans have known this for eons, thousands and thousands of years, and today it's known as companion planting. We teach the, the children, if you didn't have Costco and Target, what would you use to make your the pieces, your tools, and part, you know your utensils of your daily life? And it would be the plants and the animals and what's around you. So just that environmental concept of the, your affinity with the land and the animals that we, we teach a lot. And we show that in our exhibitions also. 
but this place is um, is unique in the sense there are other um, wonderful places, Cooley Local and Point Reyes. They also have a replicated uh, site, a village site in Olin Poly. What makes us um, unique is that we're the Museum of the American Indian. So our classes are about the Coast Miwok and the local natives and uh, Southern Pomo people and in the Bay Area. But our exhibitions include tribes from all over the country. So yeah, I've noticed that they're mm -hmm. very sophisticated. I was Thank wondering. You. You're welcome. How? Who does that? Who does the exhibits? Who curates? Well, I curated the, our present exhibit, which is creation stories, animal speak, and mm -hmm. so I chose tribes from uh, ten tribes from across the uh, the country, so that to get the flavor of um, how diverse and wonderful all of our tribes are. We've got about. 567 federally recognized tribes in the United States, and there are many tribes that aren't federally recognized. Right. So people have, I don't think they realize how much diversity we have in the country still of Native people. Mm -hmm. and, people are and I wanted to ask you about this exhibit. I haven't been up here in a while. It was a completely different exhibit last yes. time mm -hmm. I was here. Um, I think it was about jewelry. It was about a year or two ago. Well, I change the exhibit twice a year, mm -hmm. uh, and so there, there are new exhibits. And so this one was unusual and really fun to do. Um, mm -hmm. Alexandra Koch of Wealth Plus um, gave me a grant to do an exhibit, and she helped me brainstorm about what we would like to do. And so we decided on creation stories because there's, again, the diversity of Native people and, uh, and mm -hmm. cultures, and so this would you know, show the oral tradition and the history, and it also shows the amazing f affinity that Native people have with animals because they're a part of the creation. Mm -hmm. So it shows, and it also teaches, um, the stories all talk about balance and, and living in balance with all of life. And it's uh, such an opportunity to it, it show that, and we got the, the animals from the Lindsay Wildlife Museum, and they were very gracious in, in letting us have the um, borrow the animals to show the stories. So for mm -hmm. the children, it's come alive in a new way. You know, they're very excited, and um, I'm I'm really pleased with with how we we have got ten stories from ten different tribes. Are they very similar to each other, or very different from each other? Mainly different, except for you'll see the Iroquois and the Chippewa. They both have muskrat and um, turtle in their story. And so again, like I had, we talked about earlier, that native being expressive of their environment is what animals are there, right? And what plants are there. And so again, that's the same with the stories. Can you uh, walk me through a little bit? I'd so love to. See. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. So I, I somehow want to grab a sense of the stories themselves, like the white buffalo calf. Right. The, but you know, the, that's one of the things with. Um, the creation stories could often go on for days. So mm -hmm. even getting them to a poster size is really condensing them. Mm -hmm. To get them to a sentence or two is, is really hard. Um, but if you can see the animals, you know, the buffalo, the white buffalo calf woman appeared uh, as a white buffalo and then the white buffalo calf woman- The woman came out of it. Came out of it, yes. Yeah. And, uh, and handed the, the pipe And she to... said she'd return to bring, purify the world and bring harmony and spiritual balance. And there have been some white buffalo calves born yes. in the last few years. And it's right. very exciting. And uh, you'll see the tribes will go and honor when there has been a, a white cup, uh, buffalo calf born. So you gathered these objects. This, that... is, this is from the museum's collection. And the, the eagle feather fan. And um, there's a pipe that is, you know, uh, separate. The stem is not they're right. all stored together. Yes. And uh, yes. these are from the museum's collection, the beaded moccasins. Mm -hmm. And like I said, I didn't really have any pieces that were Pawnee, but I wanted to tell this beautiful story. Um, and so um, it's, it's just different. It's sun and moon had a son and married the evening star and the morning mm. star. And it's, uh, it's, it's so beautiful. It and, is. Um, yeah, just, I'm just getting some of the words are coming out at me from the poster, mm -hmm. and they're... So I hope when people come to the exhibit that they take the time to read the stories. Mm -hmm. And then if they want to know more about it, then you can Google the stories, and they're much, much longer that, than what was on this poster size right. here. 
I like this. The Shoshone and the Bannocks were living in harmony when a group of vicious little warriors drove them away with bows and arrows. Most native tribes have little people mm -hmm. in their culture. You know, I mean, the English have the elves and the fairies, and uh, in native uh, culture and histories and stories, there's the little people. Mm -hmm. And so they make a relationship with the cougar and the fox and the bobcat. Now, in this story, there's also the wolf, and um, there just wasn't room to have the wolf in here. But um, <laughs> these are, this is a Pawnee basket, and mm -hmm. um, so, you know, they're working together, and they made an agreement. They would help them get rid of the vicious little people if they would never hunt them. So today, the, the Shoshone honor that. Neither eat nor kill them. Mm -hmm. Stay away from them. Cherokee. This is ah. Cherokee, and we've got an owl and a buzzard, and we have a beetle. And the water beetle is actually very small, but mm. we, we have a bigger one so that the, the children can see it. And, um, you know, the, the animals and plants were told to keep watch. And, and many of the stories have about water, that water was everywhere and uh, how the earth was created, you know, depended on these animals creating the landmass. The great uh, buzzard flew down and his wings, uh, uh, struck that made the valleys and made mountains so um that's how the cherokee country was was created i know something about the the coast miwok one of the legends of the coyote is that um the the coyote landed on the top of mount Tamalpais, and that was the only piece of land everything else was all water and then the water drained away that became the shape of the miwok world and the coyote created people? Well, this is, yeah, this is the um, Sierra Miwok. And as you mm -hmm. see, um, they, on each hill, they placed a, a buzzard or a crow feather. And the crow feathers became people, and the buzzard feathers became chiefs. And, uh, and then after they made the people, then they became animals. And um, this is Bradley Cooper. He made the necklace that I'm wearing. He made this necklace, and then this is a clamshell necklace. And it's a falcon. And Falcon and Coyote worked together in this endeavor to create the world. Because a native person drives a car or has a house and watches TV, that they're not cultural. But they still, native people, live in two cultures. And so what we do here is we honor the cultures of native people. And also, I always try to have a piece by contemporary artists to show that the contemporary people, that native people are here. Mm -hmm. and. People think all Native people look alike, and they don't. No, you know? not at all. So we celebrate that diversity, and we celebrate that um, how Native people had the affinity with the land and the animals and uh, their just the beauty of their artistry. I want to do an exhibit called The Art of Survival because it shows, you know, from the depending on what plants are around is what the Native people used. And so I realized that Native people are very expressive of the land where they live because that's the plants and that's the rocks and, you know, those are the materials that they use. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, we teach that and we hold a, a place for Native people. Uh, I just had two young Native people, one's um, Yurok and one is uh, Clinkett, and in their 20s, and they said they were so happy they want to be involved now because there wasn't really a place for them to you know, go and really participate in cult Native cultures, so. So you're helping the communities come together, the current communities of, of with the different ethnicities that they have, yes. different, different tribes that they have, to come here. That's a very important function besides ha being a museum, which sounds static, although they're not really static. Well, this is not, but it also has uh, this communal function too. Well, that's what we struggle with is, is, the, is the word museum. And we've talked about changing it to cultural center, but we realized that sometimes when, if someone heard, say they were, they heard Filipino cultural center, they would think only the Filipinos went to it. So mm -hmm. it's a word that we struggle with because you're right, we're very hands-on, interactive, dynamic, and you don't always associate that with museums, but you know, that was the title for it. And it actually, uh, 47 years ago, there was a major excavation here, and... On this property, this yes. land? and so they needed a place yeah. to put all the projectile points and the pieces that they found, and so we've been a repository and storage and protector of those pieces. 
for 47 years. And people still bring things in that they're digging in their yard and they find it or, you know, it's been in their family for a long time and they're not sure what to do with it. So we try to protect those pieces. One of my challenges is to try to reach out to people to come because once they come here and they see, you know, how inter interesting it is and how um, uh, all the wonderful things that we have to see and learn about Native people, that um, then they get really excited about it. And I change the exhibits twice a year and depending on what your interest is, I mean, people that really like pottery, you know, that was the group of people that really came through. We had a big exhibit on pottery or textiles. We did, um, we did uh, southwestern rugs. We've done jewelry. Um, like I said, our current is uh, creation stories. And so I change the exhibits um, every couple of years. And oh, we just had Precious Cargo, which is California Indian Cradle Baskets. Mm -hmm. And so there's just an endless, you know, of, uh, different exhibits that we can do. And always, again, having contemporary people a part of it, contemporary artists. Do you often have um, events that couple with the shows where you bring people in and... and yes, oftentimes, uh, particularly at the opening, I'll have uh, mm -hmm. either the curator, uh, you know, I co-create or create, or sometimes they're like the person who is an expert in pottery, he would give a lecture at the opening about the pot so that people could understand, you know, if they had questions about the different pots. And we, as you can see upstairs, we have some prehistoric pots, which were quite wonderful. Mm -hmm. And you have incredible collection of baskets. Okay, here we are in the museum's uh, collection room of the basketry. This is temperature and humidity controlled. It's a beautiful um, array and display of baskets from all over. And uh, like I said, the basketry, particularly of the California Indians, is so gorgeous that in the next year or two, I would like to have an exhibition of our basketry. And we're in the process of doing a nag for grant, which is a federal grant, and we're going through the collection and identifying which uh, tribes, uh, what pieces we have, and, um, and pieces just keep uh, coming in. Remember I told you the, the story of the woman who um, gave us the basket that her grandfather had gotten because he had um, sold groceries to the, the native people up and down the coast. So here is the basket that we thought potentially could be uh, Coast Miwok, but it's Como. And you can see that at one time it was covered with feathers. The, that, that's the ends of the feathers. And so um, we have, as you can see, there's not much room, but uh, we keep getting donations and we're so thrilled when people do donate and we try to take care of the pieces and preserve them and uh, take care of them and honor them and uh, put them in ex exhibitions. You saw upstairs, even though it was creation stories, we still had a Pawnee basket in uh, the, the case to help the story, so we use them, our pieces, as much as we can. So the different tribes had different patterns and different way of the starts. Um, oftentimes they'll look at a piece and um, you'll look at the bottom to see how it started, and that can be identifying factor. The, the pieces that are in the, the basket and the colors and the design. I was wondering about the baskets because my understanding where I, what I was taught before is that there weren't any Coast Miwok baskets around. They're all in Russia. Is that true? That is true. Russia and Germany. Um, Betty Girk, when she wrote the book Chief Marin, she had to travel to um, Russia and Germany to get pictures. Now, occasionally we hear that someone might have one or, you know, we're always looking to find one. Someone, her grandfather, she came by every day here, such an adventure because I, I never know who's going to come in with mm -hmm. what piece. And uh, a couple of years ago, we had some Chinese anthropologists and a Japanese archaeologist come to, because they're studying, you know, Stone Age people and how do people honor the indigenous people. Mm -hmm. And, um, but her grandfather had sold groceries up and down the coast to native people and he had gotten paid in baskets. And so um, she thought maybe she had a Coast Miwok basket for us. Uh -huh. And so she sent it and donated it to the museum. This just happened in December. And it turns out that it, we think that it's probably a Como basket. It wasn't. We really had our hopes up that we have one that we think potentially could be a Coast Miwok. But, right. You know, and the, you can tell somehow by the, the weaving? The, one, the, the weavers, yeah, the, the really mm -hmm. experts. We have a couple of experts that we, you know, ask to mm -hmm. look at. Julia? Julia Parker. Julia Parker. Well, Ralph Shanks, he's written a few books on California Indian basketry. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. And we always have him look at what we have. And... Um, 
Like I said, we have over 4,000 school children come every year from every county in the Bay Area to learn about the local natives. And um, Marin County is Coast Miwok, and Sonoma County is Homo, and there's Coast Anoan and Ohlone, and there's different tribes, but they come here from everywhere because this is, this, you know, small museum on a Coast Miwok Village site is hands-on room, as you can see, that the kids get an interactive um, experience, dynamic experience. There's the exhibits that they get to see. Mm -hmm. They get to see, you know, why would people live near a stream? And they build craft things and they, build uh, craft things. And they learn about the drill that, that drills through stone and, right. and, and shells. Yeah. And um, it's very lively here. It is very lively with all the, the and you know, the neighbors, they all have been so supportive of the new museum, but they also like that the park is full of children every day. I mean, Tuesday through Friday, we have classes every day, you know, throughout the year. And um, it's, it's, I really believe what we do is so important because I feel like um, they get the experience. It's not just reading from a book, oh, Native people did this or did that, but they come here and get this real kinesthetic experience and see a place where people live and it becomes really alive for them so that's and it's a very important part of what we do is is educating because adults come in with a lot of questions too and a lot of like I've had um, educated people say there are no California Indians left and I'm just so stunned and I you know I say well there's 300 over 300,000 California natives and you just don't know what they look like you know, maybe you think they're Hispanic or, you know, mm -hmm. they just, they don't realize that Native people all look different. You know, they think they, they either look like the Plains Indians or the, um, the Southwest Navajo Indians or the, you know, Alaskan tribes. But that, you know, all the tribes, mm -hmm. there's a lot of diversity in, in culture and in how they look. It's probably because the media has not been as thorough as it could be in, mm -hmm. in exploring the differences in the, in the tribes and, and the various cultures mm -hmm. because the, you just see, and you still see cowboy and Indian movies and... <laughs> yes. Well, the other thing, I asked some high school kids, how many natives do you think lived here before the Europeans came? And this one young man raised his hand and said, oh, there weren't any, they had all died. And I thought, well, no, there were 22 million people that lived here. Columbus did not discover America. 22 million people lived here and they knew where they lived. <laughs> why don't you join us? Alicia, why don't you join yeah, us? This is our on. teacher. Yeah, maybe you Alicia, can, yeah, that's, 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 that's a can, good place to see. You can uh, join <laughs> in too. And she's been teaching for about five years, right? Uh, this is my fourth year. Fourth year. Um, I'm mm -hmm. on my fourth. And she's mm -hmm. a wonderful storyteller. Oh, we just, yeah, yes. we heard one of your stories and hopefully the viewer will, will hear some of it too. <laughs> um, it's a lot of fun. Um, and I keep it playful, but I hit certain points. I feel that part of my job mm -hmm. is to correct inaccurate labels. Mm -hmm. And the first one that I touch on, um, I bring him over to meet Grandma Bay. An arbalist told me she's about 200 years old. So I start there. That's Imagine. a tree? Mm -hmm. Okay. Bay tree. She's a beautiful tree over there. Uh -huh. And, you know, so I help them connect by, well, you guys climb trees. Well, imagine for 200 mm -hmm. years that's mm -hmm. been happening. Mm -hmm. Um, and talk about harvesting, but they, but I also let them know that they were also trimming the trees, mm -hmm. you know, and they were managing the, the, the meadows. Mm -hmm. And when the first non-natives came here, there, there was huge fields of California poppy. And, Do you know of poppy? Oh, yeah, we know the California poppies, you know, St. Sanders. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, and then I talk about how the women were managing it, using a seed beater. We have I can't grab it right now, but using seed beaters and all the different steps, mm -hmm. not managing it. And so the inaccurate label is that California Indians are simple hunters and gatherers, that they were wandering through the forest and foraging. <laughs> like, right. Uh, hello. <laughs> Here for a couple thousand years, I think they learned a thing or two, you know. And so they're, everyone is very uh, captured in that mm -hmm. moment because they, they go, what, they weren't just simple hunters and gatherers? No, they were master gardeners. And they, they, they were big um, mm -hmm. fields that they were managing, mm -hmm. all these flowers, and refer to the work of Ken Anderson and, and uh, um, uh, Tending the Wild. Yeah, Tending the Wild really gives a good uh, example of uh, the idea of that the, the bushes were trimmed, the fields were burnt after the harvesting of the grasses, which they realized propagated the seeds and enriched the soil and 
the Spanish wouldn't let them do that anymore after they came, so we lost a lot of our native book grasses. But this that. concept, Tending the Wild, is that, you know, it wasn't just beautiful for no reason. And what I think is what she's saying is so important is that how, how can people don't know about native people, you know, or how, how come there are all these misconceptions? And we, are, we work very hard to try to break down those stereotyping and mm -hmm. those myths. Well, there was a specific grant, like I said, from the Haas Foundation, and it was to support an artist in a project like this. So he's recreating um, traditional homo regalia in a traditional way. And um, he's been making regalia for a while, and he, w he was even surprised how long each step took. I mean, remember, in a time when there was no TV or radio, I mean, people had time and they slowed down and they knew what it took to make these really beautiful pieces. And it was such an important part of their spiritual lives. And so to communicate and share that, these cases that we have in the hands-on room, it's not just the final piece, which I was saying earlier, it shows the steps. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think is when you're saying about sharing the knowledge, is that you don't just go to Target and buy some clamshell beads. Yeah. First you've got to go get the Washington clamshell which is a certain size and then you break it in pieces and then you put the hole in it and then you grind it and you grind them all to be even and the same size mm -hmm. and, the, and the smaller they are the more grinding. These are clamshell beads here and of uh, the abalone you know first you've got to get the abalone and then you know <laughs> then you cut it and then you polish it up and you've got to go get your pine seeds and so it's pine nuts so it's um it's a different concept even of what life is like and what it is to make to slow down and pay attention. And I often tell the children when they leave, go home and see what's in your yard. What kind of plants do you have? Mm -hmm. We love um, making, um, this is cattail rope. And so I love showing, uh, she teaches the kids how to make this cordage because they can go by an area, wetlands, and they can see the cattails and they know that this, you can make rope from that plant. So it changes their concept and their relationship and their image of their environment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 and I'm a taco, yes. Oh. Thank you.